rolling. Yeah, roll, roll it. Mark it. Hi Ronan, I'm Cheba. Hey, Good to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. So can you tell me a little bit about the history of winemaking in Burgundy? Yeah, the history of winemaking Burgundy, that's, uh, that's how long have you got? We're talking, you know, a thousand years worth of history here. I guess the grape kind of came into France and travelled around most of France, really brought by the Romans and the Roman army. Initially it came in through sort of the Marseille area, travelled all the way up the Rhone Valley and then eventually kind of got to the, sort of the, the slopes of Burgundy. If you've got several thousand guys all marching and they're not fighting and they're getting a bit restless, the best way to keep them sedated is by giving them lots to drink. So yeah, so that was the kind of the Roman army sort of moving through across the world really that was bringing that grape variety Vitis vinifera everywhere it went. I guess, you know, the most significant thing that really happened in Burgundy was um, the monasteries. So it was the rise of the sort of ecclesiastical orders. You know, there were big abbeys over at sort of the Abbey of Cluny and the Abbey of Cito. And you had the Benedictine monks and you had the Cistercian monks. For them, it was a great source of income. When you went to Burgundy, you see all those little tiny plots, the little vineyards. You know, the vineyards are not big, you know, they're small, some of the size of a couple of tennis courts. So it was really the sort of the monks that were working those vineyards year after year. So they were the ones that kind of said, okay, this area is particularly good. You know, this is going to be our best wine and this area is not so good. So this is going to be our least good wine. Burgundy definitely grew more organically and over time and with, you know, generations of, of monks kind of seeing what was the best vines and who produced the best. So the Clos de Vougeot itself was built in about 1339, something like that, so a long time ago. And then if you go into Bone itself, you'll see this old hospital called the Hospice de Bone that was built in 1443. And it was built by this guy called Nicolas Roland. The hospital built up lots of vineyards, lots of land, and now they have famous winemakers that will make the wine from it, and they'll have an auction every November. It's on the third Thursday of November. They auction off barrels, so you can go and buy a full barrel of Burgundy. Can you tell me the history of the negotiations? So like we said, the churches owned all the vineyards, you know, they were big landowners, and then came along the French Revolution. And basically what happened then is a lot of the sort of wealthy landowners, including the church, they had all that land taken off them. And a lot of that land was given back to the, you know, the general population, you know, the sort of the peasants, the common people. Um, so that all of a sudden they start owning vineyards. But it's an expensive business making wine and selling wine and distributing it. So you definitely got this rise of uh, people called the negotiant. So a negotiant is basically someone who will deal with the farmers, the grape growers. They'll buy in either the grapes or the fully made wine. They'll put it in barrels themselves, they'll age it, then they bottle it and then they sell it and distribute it. And nowadays I think the negotiants have, uh, are getting less and less. You know, I think some of the good negotiants that are still around, that have lasted for a long time, your Louis Jadot, your Romoissonnet, your Bouchard, people like that, you know, they're still around. But I think that nowadays, you know, Burgundy has reached such astronomic prices that if you own a little plot of Burgundy, you'd be crazy not to make the wine yourself and sell it yourself. So how are the best producers linked to the history of Burgundy? Burgundy is kind of, as we talked about, is all really about history. You know, the best producers are usually linked to, uh, historically, to families that have had those domains for generations. It's very, very difficult for a family to come in and buy vineyards now because it's just so expensive. One thing that did happen in Burgundy as well is what was called the Napoleonic Law of Inheritance. So really, after the French Revolution, what happened is that people inherited vineyards. And then Napoleon came along and he basically said, uh, on his own by a family, once the patriarch, the father of that family dies, then that domain must be divided up between the children. So this has kind of happened in Burgundy. So basically you have a vineyard and one generation, you have four kids, it will get split up into four. Next generation, that vineyard has four more kids, that gets split up into four. So literally the vineyards over generations have got cut, 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 smaller and smaller and smaller. So, you know, if you're a big family with a big history that's been around for a long time, you can, you can hopefully keep some of that vineyard. But otherwise, um, you know, you'll go to see, visit some people and they will walk you through a vineyard and they'll say, okay, this row is mine, this row is my sister's, this row is my cousin's, this row is my second cousin. Uh, so it's just been fractionalized down to really, really small proportions. What do you think makes Burgundy so special? Well, I think it's definitely the history. You know, there's not very many wine regions in the world that have such a long history. You know, you find them in France, you find them in Italy, um, you know, but a long, long history. You can imagine that, that literally, you know, over those generations, you know, plant material and vines and things like that kind of 
uh, mutate and adapt to their environment. And if you've essentially got the same vines that have been there for, you know, 1,800 years, something like that, then they really kind of adapt to the environment. You know, the Mother Nature is very clever. It gets to know that it's like this in August, it's like this in springtime, it's going to be this hot in summer, this is the amount of water that the soil's going to give them, this is the amount of rainfall that they're going to get. So they really kind of adapt and mutate to form their best expression from that particular plot of land. And you know, you could go to Burgundy and maybe take one of the vines out of Burgundy, out from a famous domain, and then take it off to somewhere like Chile or Argentina or South Africa or somewhere like that, plant it, it's not going to perform the same, you know, because it's in a different environment. But what that, what that extended period of history gives you is that, you know, the, uh, the perfect vine growing in the perfect environment that's really adapted into its environment. So, so, but probably the thing that makes Burgundy, you know, so special is that it's in such limited quantities. Like we say, you go to a producer and he might make one barrel, might have one row of vines. If he's a very famous producer, then that one barrel, 300 odd bottles, um, supplies the world. Plus, you know, these are sort of craftsmen that have been doing this for a long, long time, so they really know how to perfect the best expression that you can from those grape varieties in that environment.